I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, some of you know we had originally scheduled this in February. <laughs> and, uh, needless to say, we didn't do it. Uh, and Barbara was kind enough to work with us to reschedule. We looked at a couple of dates, and this date seemed to work the best. And we couldn't have planned for better weather, so I think you had a hand in that, perhaps. Uh, in any case, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Walter Powell, the director of the Mayflower Society. Relatively new, uh, came here just not quite two years ago. And uh, it's been my privilege to get to know the organization progressively over time, and the individuals have contributed so much to it uh, at all levels. Uh, two of our representatives today have been extraordinarily involved in one of the most vital projects that we do, which for the benefit of those that are not aware of it is what we often refer to in-house either as the Silver Book Series or the Mayflower Family Series, or the Five Generations Project. And it's a project that had its conception back in the early 1970s, and in fact, both of our speakers could tell you a lot more about it than I can. But it is our best seller, and it's our most proud accomplishment. And the current volume, volume 24, the Brewster volume, has been long awaited, much discussed. And uh, when it came out in January, there was a great deal of excitement, which was reflected both in the sales and in the inquiries we had almost immediately on the internet or by phone. Uh, so without saying any more, it's a real privilege to introduce Barbara Lambert Merrick, past historian in general of the Mayflower Society, longtime member of the 5G Project with many, many accomplishments, who will speak today on Elder Brewster, and Scott Andrew Bartley, or Drew as we call him affectionately, uh, a frequent contributor to the Mayflower Descendant, the Mass Society publication, as well as a distinguished genealogist and author in his own right. And so we're delighted to have both of you here today. And Barbara, I'm going to turn the podium over to you. Thank you all. Today is a day of celebration for the 24th volume of Mayflower Family Series, often called the 5G Books or a Silver Book, which has been published by the General Society and as Walt says, it is long, or was long awaited. I hope you have all gotten copies of it, and I hope that most of you are Brewster descendants here today. The high number of the volume in no way defines the importance of the main subject, Elder William Brewster. His life story has not been fabricated by figments of fancy fiction or by enhancing family tradition. It is one of historical fact. We know firsthand that he was held in the highest of esteem through many biographies written by two of his contemporaries, William Bradford and Nathaniel Morton, who paid homage to him and documented his worth to Plymouth Colony. Much has been written about William Brewster in the past, and more will probably be written in the future. But this is a special and valuable historical tribute to him, as it contains all the known facts identified for the elder and his family. The contents have been researched and retrieved from primary source documents in Holland, England and here in New England, so that the parentage, birth, marriage, and death of every descendant for four generations has been supported by citation to specific references. Also addressed are previous misidentifications, errors, and hoaxes associated with the Brewster name. While the focus of the work follows the life and accomplishments of William Brewster and a small portion on the descendants of Isaac Gallatin, who married William's daughter, Fear, born in before the recording of vital records, no church records have been found to support his birthday. But William made an affidavit in Holland in which he gave his age and allowed for calculations to support his year of birth, which has been placed as February, between, um, between uh, February, uh, Jan June of 1566 and June of 1567. 
His early childhood years are assumed to have been spent in Scrooby, on the River Wrighton in Nottinghamshire, England. This locale is based on the facts that William Brewster Sr. was taxed there in Scrooby Parish as early as 1571 and commissioned in 1575 by the Archbishop of Canterbury to the life position of bailiff receiver or collector of taxes and rents from the multiple parishes which uh, connected to Scrooby. William Sr. was also appointed master of the post at the manor house and was responsible for providing overnight <coughs> lodging for travelers on the Great North Road and especially for the royal messengers who needed fresh horses for their mission of carrying official correspondence between London and Scotland. These facts indicate that William came from a trusted and respectable family, if not a genteel or an affluent. <coughs> it is unknown where and from whom he received his early education, but it is certain that he was trilingual and proficient in reading, writing, and speaking English, Latin, and Greek, as this was a requirement for admission to St. Peter's College at Cambridge University, which he entered in December of 1580. Enrolled in, at 14 years of age, William was listed as a pensioner student, or one who was able to pay for his room and board. His curriculum study is unknown, but at that time, a student usually uh, began this morning with church service, followed by his classes, and during meals, a Bible clerk read aloud from the scriptures. This time spent at the university would have allowed association with fellow students, many of whom became religious leaders or re authors of religious materials, copies of which were found in Brewster's library when he passed away. This period of time at Cambridge gives William the distinction of being the only Mayflower passenger to have had a college education. A promising young man, after college, William into the service of William Davidson, an ambassador and secretary of state to Queen Elizabeth I of England, and accompanied his patron with travels to Holland and the Low Companies on official business. Sir William's diplomatic mission was to ascertain whether France, with its Reformed Church, had committed to support Protestant Holland should the Spanish pursue the efforts of the Pope to bring the Dutch into Catholic obedience, or whether Holland and Spain would be able to negotiate a truce. While in the Netherlands, William Brewster had opportunity to master the Dutch language, encounter individuals holding important positions in the government, and to observe that the Dutch nation gave refuge to people seeking religious freedom. Leaving the diplomatic service when his patron was dishonored and discharged due to involvement in the issuing of a warrant for the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, William returned to his former residence at Scrooby, married and raised a family. The maiden name of his wife has not been proven. Presentation of Mary Wentworth and Mary Ryle do not meet criteria for approval according to present day genealogical standards, but the identification continues to be perpetuated in personal genealogies on the net and in published articles. The Brewster family had a strong association with the Church of England. Both William and his father served the Archbishop of, of York at Scrooby. His uncle, Henry Brewster, was the vicar of the neighboring Sutton Cum Lound. As an Episcopal agent and vicar in charge of the church chapel, he received a stipend, but not the tithes of the church, which went to the archbishop. Uncle Henry was succeeded by another man bearing the Brewster name, 
James Brewster, who developed a history of conflict with the church also, but was not among those who emigrated to Holland. In early uh, 1680, religion was undergoing a tumultuous period of time. For many years, the Church of England had adhered to total conformity to being subordinate to the Pope. When Elizabeth I assumed the throne, she returned the church to Protestant reform, whereby the monarch was the official head of the church with supervision over the um, bishops in the um, area. Some of the clergy and people refused to embrace Protestantism and obey the reform. Others felt the church should be simplified even more with division of church and state. Bishops were ordered to execute ecclesiastical laws whereby absence from the church service or failing to communicate, take communion were to be reported to the archdeacon by the church warden and fines were levied for each offense. About Easter time in 1598, William Brewster and his family were among those resorting to churches in service and time other than their home parish. The ecclesiastical reports of June 1598 also document the presentment of William Brewster for repeating sermons in public in the church of St. Wilfred's in Scrooby Village without authority. In defense, William, who was identified as a gentleman in the brackets, responded that the towns of Bawtry and Scrooby maintained one preacher between the two towns, so that the sermon was preached on Sundays in alternate towns. He attended the service where the sermon was to be preached, even if he had to be absent from his own parish. Then, in the afternoon, he gathered with others and discussed the sermon. The ex explanation of the infractions resulted in dismissal of his case with simple admonition. Lacking formal divinity training, that entry probably designates his first time repeating and giving sermons as a uh, preacher. Upon the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, it was the hope of the Puritans, like the Brewsters, that he, his successor, James Stuart, King of Scotland, would further reform and simplify the church. The grievances were presented to the king in the form of a petition. Some of their um, listed uh, concerns included replacement of improper preachers, breaking up the wealth of the ecclesiastical uh, officials who derived income from more than one of the church parishes simultaneously. They wanted the clergy to perform marriage ceremonies, not the civil servants. They, ended, they wanted to end the use of wedding rings in marriage ceremonies. Other uh, objections were bowing every time the name of Jesus was said. Um, they um, objected to the use of caps and surplus for the uh, ministers. They uh, wanted um, communion to be served with a sermon, and it was served in the alternate church without the minister being present. Someone else gave the communion. And making the sign of the cross over infants at baptism. And then they also objected to baptism by midwives when a child was born near death. Arrangements were made for a conference to address the religious issues. It was to be held at Lon in London, but the plague was in London at that time, so it went to Hampton Court. 
supported and influenced by the advisors from the Episcopal Church, King James authorized only minor changes to the Book of Common Prayer, and provision was arranged for a new translation of the Bible, which is now called the King James Version. Hope of additional reform was dashed when the king stated at the end of the conference, if this be all they have to say, I shall make the people conform themselves, or harry them out of the land, or do worse. A series of canons or church rules were issued to suppress structured reform, and the clergy were ordered to strictly enforce them. Clerics with puritanical leanings were summoned to the ecclesiastical court. If they did not appear, they were excommunicated and deprived of their paid positions. Others among the clergy n n did not associate themselves, and while being more lax in enforcing ecclesiastical rule, continued to preach to small congregations such as the one at Scroby. The meetings at Scroby continued and were apparently overlooked by the officials, possibly due to the Brewster's connection to the church. Bradford's history reported that Brewster walked according to the light he saw till the Lord revealed to him further. However, it is not known exactly when William changed from working for puritanical reform within the church to the idea and desire to be separate from the Church of England. Bradford also revealed that the Puritans were haunted day and night. Fines were leveled for religious infractions, and some were imprisoned. Seeking salvation from persecution, the separatists who held the sincere belief that accepting the official stance of the Church of England would be a sin. They came to the understanding that they had to escape from England and continue to suffer or, or continue to suffer the consequences. They elected to go into exile in Holland. William resigned his position as Master of the Post in Scrooby in September of 1607. And the records document meant that a scant two and a half months later, in December of 1607, a warrant was issued for his, the, his arrest due to disobedience in matters of religion. The warrant was served to Brewster, but he failed to appear at the High Court of Commissioners. When the officials went to arrest him, he was not there but a fine was levied of 20 pounds. The separatists did not apply for the required permission to leave Ingram, and their two attempts to do so in secret met with misfortune. The first attempt failed due to the treachery of the master of the ship hired to transport them to Holland, and they were stripped of their money and all of their possessions. Confined for a time, most were dismissed and sent back home. But Brewster was one of the seven men incarcerated at the Boston Guild Hall, which gives him the distinction of being the only member of the Mayflower contingent of pilgrims to have been impressed in England for his religious beliefs. The second attempt to exit from England met with misfortune, but eventually all of the separatists made it to Amsterdam. Within the year, the separatists petitioned to be allowed to settle in the Dutch city of Leiden. Possibly, the success in obtaining permits may have been due to uh, William's prior acquaintance with Dutch officials, such as Jan van Holt, town secretary of Leiden, who would have been a rising political presence in William's first trip to Holland. It is also interesting to note that the town secretary, Jan, had control of the town printing press. <laughs> Little is known about the lives of the separatists during the decade in which they lived in Holland, except for what can be found in Dutch records documenting betrothals, the gold membership, and death. 
Most of the separatists were humble English farmers who had to learn to work in the crafts and trades. But even though they labored diligently, their poor conditions did not improve greatly. William Brewster, however, with his knowledge of languages, was apparently able to derive income by teaching English to the students at Leyden University. About 1617, desiring to advance the zeal for reform in the Church of England, with the added financial aid of Thomas Brewer, William Brewster began to typeset and publish books of, at his shop on the court and better known to us as Choir Alley. His helpers were John Reynolds and Pilgrim Edward Winslow. Of the Brewster imprints in 1617, one in Dutch and two in Latin, William Brewster's name appears on the title page as the printer and Leiden as the place of printing. A Dutchman named Jan Orley is nephew and protege of Leyden's town secretary, Jan Van Holt, was a neighbor of Brewster's. Orlius was also a printer, publisher, and historian, who later became the mayor of Leyden. Orlius is known to have helped distribute some of the Pilgrim Press books at a fair in Frankfurt, while others were smuggled into England and Scotland. Pilgrim imprint number, Pilgrim Press imprint number 17 is of great interest, as it was written in response to 10 counter demands by Thomas Drakes. Thomas questioned whether it were not the separatist's best course to return to God's church, true church, and people, or if they were not willing to take this course by permission of the king and the honorable council to remove into Virginia and make a plantation in hope of converting the infidels there into Christianity. <laughs> Following the peace of many years between Holland and Spain, it was nearing an end and the Dutch population became tense over prospects of war. <coughs> the separatists had their own problems and were concerned as they had not increased in size with like-minded Christians from England joining them. English identity was being lost by melding into Dutch society and the hope to spread their concept of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ among the peoples of Netherlands just did not happen. These factors all weighed heavily on their minds. Desiring to continue to be able to practice religion freely and yet remain true and loyal Englishmen, they decided to leave Holland, emigrate to Virginia Colon, as suggested by Drakes. Pastor John Robinson and Elder Brewster were, wrote many letters to relatives, friends, and sympathizers in the mother country, seeking financial support for their venture. <coughs> Robinson and Brewster also carefully designed seven articles for the church congregation to consider, which acknowledged that the king had authority and assenting to the articles of the Church of England. Negotiations across the channel were lengthy, progress wavered, and Brewster, acting as an agent, accompanied Robert Pushman back to England to oversee the, statue of the, the status of the negotiations with the Virginia Company. Leading investors of the company were Sir Edwin Sandys, who was the governor and treasurer of the group, with his brother Samuel Sandys. Both were sons of Edwin Sandy, who, as Archbishop of York, had given William Brewster Sr. the position as Master of the Post at Scrooby. About this time, two of the books printed by the Pilgrim Press critical of King James I were widely circulating in England and in Scotland. The English ambassador to Holland requested the Dutch authorities to issue warrants for the arrest of both William Brewster and his financial partner Thomas Brewer. Only Brewer was found, but to prevent publication of additional books, 
The printing or typesetting equipment was impounding, but a printing press was not among the items seized. Negotiations with the Virginia Company were completed in May of 1619. During preparations to depart from Holland, it was determined that financial arrangements limited the options of the entire groups setting sail in one group. The youngest and healthiest were chosen to be the colonists, and the elder Brewster was chosen to accompany them and provide spiritual guidance. When the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth and the compact was drawn up to govern the colony, William Brewster was probably one of the leaders instrumental in developing the content which set in place the first foundation for a democratic government. William is known to have personally attended to the ill during the fatal illness of the first winter. He is listed with respect and title of Mr. in the 1623 Division of Land and the 1627 Division of Cattle. His name also appears on the 1623 list of freemen. He was one of the men who agreed to undertake to pay and discharge and acquit the said colony of all debt when the major adventurers who had invested in the enterprise became disenchanted with the project and provided less financial support to the pilgrims. He was also on the first tax list for the colony of New Plymouth. One of William's final acts was when his daughter, Thea Brewster Allerton, passed away. He took up the job of being mentor to Isaac Allerton, Jr., his grandson, and he educated him to the point where he was able to enter Harvard College. Not knowing much about the personal life of William Brewster, except that what can be learned from Bradford's history, we know that he was wise, faithful, and a discreet man who labored in the fields along, as long as he was able, suffered through periods of hunger with the rest of the pilgrims, taught twice every Sabbath, believed in short prayers, not long tedious <laughs> ones, and stayed true to the separatist dogma in regards to separation of church and state, for he never interfered with the politics or government of the colony. Most certainly the descendants of William Brewster can take great pride in listing him as their ancestor. In closing, I want to assure you that part two of the Brewster family is in the process of being upgraded and completed. Out of necessity, abstractions of wills and deeds will, leave, have, will have to be shorter and there will, as there is a prolific increase in the number of descendants in the fifth generation. While you wait, I trust you will all find pleasure in reviewing this book, volume number 24. In the absence of a Brewster Bible, this volume will fill the void and provide a solid foundation for the Brewster family in future years. I'm sure you're going to have questions of Barbara and uh, Drew, as the editor for this project, would you like to make a few remarks? Uh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't prepared, but I could talk to anybody. <laughs> Shy that I am. Barbara and I have known each other for 30 years, maybe? At least. Yes. So I was honored when I was uh, the one selected to help her edit and bring to fruition all of her work that she'd been working on since the 70s. Probably the 70s. But anyway. So my job was to reformat, to get it ready for publication, and then also research on uh, newer things that have become available that later on Barbara wasn't able to do in Hartford. I went down several times, uh, researched in England and in Salt Lake City for some of the uh, facts that we have in here. So just to bring it current to what is now available. My main goal was to also, as a professional genealogist, is to um, 
bring this out in the highest possible standard we could, as Barbara mentioned, meeting the criteria, and that was very important to us. So uh, we worked well together at uh, nitpicking through them all, <laughs> whether she agreed, I agreed, or we've always made a compromise anyway and found the best way to present it. So um, that is going to be our legacy with this and hopefully with future volumes of this, which I'm, I'm assuming volume, I'm at uh, fifth generation will take two of these, maybe? Two of Yeah, about two this size. So, uh, the big difference here is, um, I don't know if anybody of you have seen this, but it's, it's done more or less in the register style and with every site um, with a footnote to the exact place, not just a general source of, you know, I found it in you know, XYZ book, but <coughs> volume page, if there were online sources, we, we use those if we thought they were reliable because, as we know, not everything stays on the internet. Um, and we went to the most original source we could uh, for each fact, because some of the facts have been repeated and repeated, and we tried to get the most original one, if not citing the original document. So um, I was pleased to work with Barbara to do this. It took us a little while, but uh, hopefully it was worth it. I, I think so. <laughs> yes. And um, I have to say I'm not a Bur Brewster descendant. <laughs> I'm a Mayflower descendant, but I'm not a Brewster descendant. <laughs> but anyway, um, if anybody has any questions later about this or how we did it, feel free to ask me or Barbara. We'd be happy to uh, help you. I thought perhaps for a few minutes, if you would like, uh, Barbara and Drew perhaps you just sit up front uh, for a couple of minutes. And Sure, there'll be some questions uh, that people may want to address to. Uh, I, I might start just by asking in this long and very compelling project, is there one or two obstructions that really led you to a, a large measure of frustration before finally seeing the light in the research? Uh, either one well, of them. Let me answer that oh, one. Yes, <laughs> I will tell you, I, I had so much more in there, and he. Chum, 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 chum. <laughs> And yeah. he, just, he just wanted the facts, you know. He was like that old movie what, that was on television, and, and there was a, a detective or something. He said, oh, I wanted the facts, ma'am. Well, that's, that's what he would do. He would cut out anything that was not truthful. But this book contains no fiction, and you will find it in some of our other things that people stretch the truth a little bit, or they imagine what can happen or could have happened. As I say, I could have told you a lot of things. Who we know is often very inf influential. And it seemed like Brewster was constantly running into people that he had met before. And as I say, the Sandys were in charge of the Virginia Company. Were they the... They must have played together as children. But we can't prove it. So we can't put it in there, Bruce says. <laughs> well, the other thing that happened is maybe six or seven times we came across particular problems. And what we did at the end of the sketch, after uh, we've said everything we're going to say, these are problems that we still see, or questions we still have that we haven't been able to solve that are useful for somebody to continue the search. Because at some point you need to stop and put it in a book. So uh, that's how we try to handle that. Uh, the most problematic is we, we took out a couple of lines that um, we found no support for. And, and uh, Barbara was concerned about it, so that's part of the trips to Connecticut to see if I could unearth any minuscule fact that could actually keep them in there, and, and we didn't, so they're not. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> and I hope we didn't cut anyone's line that was here. Yeah. <laughs> Which ones were they? Mine was the um, the, the most notable one actually took out a past governor, didn't it? I can't, I can't remember even the Mi ones. Mixes. Oh, oh. We, we've added lines, too, in this. There are mixes in Connecticut, or meeks. Meeks and mixes, yeah. yeah. Um, they, they got the added. The coys. Coys were added more children. We had some in the genealogy before, and we added like three or four more. Um, yeah, we didn't cut too much, I guess. Mm -hmm. About 50-50. Well, there's a lot of lines that have not been used. 
mainly because they were female lines mm -hmm. and they marry outside of the Brewster family yep. and people lose the connection. Mm -hmm. They don't remember it. Right. And the other thing that we have going forward that we now have uh, Massachusetts Society. Uh, when I first started working on this, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the Brewster genealogy that was done in 1908. Two volumes, mm -hmm. each about this thick. It follows the grandsons of William Brewster, not the women, which of course is a problem. And I searched and searched, and, and I finally found uh, the manuscript for two more volumes like that of the granddaughters that were never published. Oh. Mm. And, and, yes, and this was uh, left with the New York Genealogical Bi yeah. Biographical Society, which is was greatly downsizing at the time, and we were concerned about that. So Mass Mayflower paid to have it all scanned, the entire manuscript, and a copy of it is, I think, is here as well. Mass Mayflower has it, and I think we have brought a copy down here too, a digital version of it. The GNB, because of that, because we paid for that uh, project, started also putting it up on their website. So if you're a member of that society, you can see some of it, but all of it are, is here as well. So. And, I, and I, I might add to it, part of the holdup on this book was financing. The General Society does need more financing to help them do these things. So, um, just beware. <laughs> Anybody help? Yes, sir. Did you spend any time trying to find Mary's name? Um, not much. Uh, I didn't. Um, I generally was when, in the course of editing, that I found a problem, I talked to Barbara about it, and then we decided whether we would uh, go after it or not. I didn't do English origins of him. I mainly did... Uh, the English stuff that I did, I'm trying to think which kid went, one kid went back, yeah. whose name escapes me now. And we tried to find more on him, and uh, I wasn't able to at the time. Have there been any efforts maybe at mitochondrial or pure maternal line from William and Mary to link that to either family? Or so the question was about uh, matrilineal, uh, mtDNA to uh, discover some of the lines. I'm not aware of any, but there are groups. There is a Mayflower group with um, family tree DNA, because I'm a member of it. My father is a matrilineal descendant of um, Priscilla Mullins. Oh. And those things are hard to find, because, of course, it's the women's maiden names that are the most difficult. So to find 15 generations of them in a row and have the documentation for it. Uh, and everyone who's contacted me, even with lines in the 1800s, not knowing where to go, uh, the most uh, notable one that I recall was somebody in Kentucky. So Kentucky's a place, if you're in the 1800s, it could go to New England or it's going to go down to Virginia. It's going to go one or the other. And if it goes down to Virginia, you're less likely to have New England roots, although you can have a, Mayf uh, a Brewster <laughs> line down there. Well, I was thinking of the possibility of even identifying Mary Brewster. Right. You know, if there's a pure matrilineal line, so that gives True. some hope. True, there. to match the other ones, yeah. But there had to have been females in each generation, daughters in every generation. There yeah, is probably quite today. a few of them, yeah. yeah. So um, the big DNA people are uh, family search, uh, family search, family tree, DNA, ancestry, and there's a third one. And there's also a website called dnamatch.net, I believe, or something like that, where you can upload your results and, and everybody can see it. So I just uploaded my father's a, a little while ago because, you know, mine's only in the FT DNA, and this would get the ancestry and the, the third one whose name escapes me right now. Are you aware of any uh, ones focused on Brewster? No, I have nothing else to offer. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Now, there's a coat of arms associated with the Brewster family. Do you know who that was granted to, and is it any association with Elder William? I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't hear the... Uh, there's a coat of arms that has been associated with the Brewster family. Uh, I know it wasn't granted to Brewster, and I don't think it was granted to his father. Do you know anything about where that? We have not really investigated the coat of arms. That is a debatable 
thing, and people have altered the coats of arms and tried to make it their own, etc. That would be another yeah. group of people who would be handling that, not us. Yeah. And we, the, did, we just do genealogy. And unfortunately, I don't think we have had opportunity to examine enough records in England. Oh yeah, there's uh, much more. They need done. to wake up and <laughs> and find out the answers for us. It's impossible for us to go over there and do the digging that needs to be done. Someone over there has to do it. And when we're talking about them, I want to talk about England and Scrooby Manor. Walt loaned me a wonderful book. What is it, Sarah Erland? Sue Allen. Sue Allen oh. did, and it's available down at the plantation if you want to uh, look into it. But it tells you all about the development of how Scrooby Manor was improved and how it ran down, etc. And it's a very good book. Uh, I do urge you to take, take a look at it. Uh, I don't know what the, do we have it in the library? We do. Yeah, we do. Uh, it's a, a very good book to tell you about where um, Elder Brewster lived, we think, as a child. To follow up on the, DNA, uh, on the um, coats of arms, for those of you who may not be aware, coats of arms are actually granted by, um, the, well, it's not College. the king directly, the College of Arms, yeah. and <laughs> to a specific person. And that, yeah, coat, and that coat of arms can only be passed down to the eldest son. son. It is a literally like a legal seal for that family. So it isn't for all Brewsters, it's for one particular person. If there is not an elder son who lives to adulthood, the coats of arms can go to the eldest daughter, and she's allowed to use this coats, coat of arms for her lifetime. And then it ends. It cannot go down below that. So, you know, if you're in, in a mall and you see the lovely little yeah. shopping cart there, I try to just walk by and not say anything, you know, because they'll sell you any kind of coats of arms. I mean, you see one, they'll say the Smith. How many choices would you have there? So that, that is the issue with the coats of arms and the things that most people don't, aren't aware of, that it is actually a legal seal for one particular person, man. I believe second sons and third sons can use coats of arms if they have a proper agency mark on them. I'm not aware of that, but that could very well be true. Well, I could have Her heraldry is not my specialty, yeah. but I do know that. We used to answer that question a lot. So, anybody else have some questions? Okay. True. Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of quick comments by way of postscript. Uh, Barbara, thank you for the reference to Scrooby Manor. Uh, some of you know because uh, we have an active sister city relationship with Plymouth, England, and to a lesser extent to Scrooby. Uh, that last fall during our Congress here in Plymouth, we had a filmmaker, an independent filmmaker named Jane Williams, visiting who'd done a preliminary documentary film on Scrooby Manor and the current owners of the manor, and the local historian who's produced the book that uh, you were referencing. And I say that because uh, as we approach 400th anniversary here in just a few years, there's much more interest now in trying to cement and increase those English connections. In fact, the society, the general society, is exploring the possibility of a UK society. Uh, there are about 45 members living in the UK who are members of the general society. Uh, and uh, the city of Plymouth in England has offered to provide perhaps some logistical support. But more to the point, Drew, you raised an excellent point, and as you did, Barbara, about funding for the silver books. Uh, the General Society increased the funding last year. Uh, we work with a budget of about $120,000 to $140,000 per year, and that's to pay researchers at fees that are very modest for those that are in the field professionally. And Drew can certainly attest to that. Uh, and uh, therefore, we look to expand the funding, which means we look to find generous donors that will help amortize that fund as well as to increase our annual allocation because this project now in what nearly 40 years of inception has got many years left to go and I think you really put your finger on the, the, the need to get at some sources and that requires money, time uh, and the right researchers to do it. So I want to laud both of you and of course Jane Fisk who did the indexing who couldn't be here today. Uh, 
and uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm sure some of you will want to talk to Barbara and Drew privately, and you're welcome to do so. Uh, enjoy the refreshments. We want to welcome you again to the Society House and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Marty Boberts. I'm Director of Genealogy and Research Services uh, here. I started last August. And in following that, we have uh, out here the Silver Books for sale uh, here. We can get any of our 24 volumes uh, and then some for you uh, that you want from our warehouse. So you know, that's one of the ways that we fund is through the sales of the books. So we hope you will uh, shop. <laughs> this afternoon as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Thank you again.